Hi everyone, this is Dr. Angelica Pina Perez broadcasting our first episode of our podcast in our Invisibility Project, which is really an um, opportunity for me to share with you some work that we're doing at Lesley University in really decolonizing expressive arts therapy practices in particular, but also in mental health counseling in a broader sense. And why am I doing this? Why are people who are doing this with me interested in this? It's, it's really a kind of a way to think about actively dismantling white supremacy, not just in our society, but in our work the work that we've dedicated our lives to every single day. You know, dismantling racism really begins with our work, not just ourselves. And we want to decolonize metaphors in particular. Um, and that's what this episode is about today, is specifically using the metaphor of blackness, darkness, as bad or as equating to negative or as wrong. Um, and some examples of this just classically in mental health is when we think about dark thoughts um, as uh, explaining things that are sinister or bad. Um, either with regards to harming ourselves or other people. Um, when we describe depressive symptoms in metaphor of using kind of just a, I'm in a dark cloud. Um, instead of actually extrapolating or deconstructing um, the metaphor itself of the dark cloud, like what it contains, what it feels like, what it, not just what it quote unquote looks like, right? That it's heavily saturated, that it's full, that it feels like it's about to burst and, and rain down tears, right? Um, but instead we kind of stay in these kind of one dimensional, uh, metaphorical descriptors that ultimately are how white supremacy is entrenched into our work. Um, because if you think about then how must it be like for our clients when we talk about all things negative, um, which are then popularly associated with all things bad. Um, using words like dark um, or, or blacking out or a, as a form of describing either a response to uh, substance abuse use or um, disassociation. Um, when all of these things really looked at through a critical race paradigm, um, we start to see that, you know, for our clients with dark skin, for our clients who live black lives, what must that be like for all of us um, to realize that what we're doing to each other is actually perpetuating the things that we say as white privileged folks that we're actually trying to dismantle, um, that we're able to walk in a Black Lives Matter protest and yet still as mental health clinicians and expressive arts therapy clinicians and as artists use the color black um, and everything that's you know, black will be used as an umbrella on term for other metaphors that we'll also explore here today um, as things that are ultimately pejoratives, bad, wrong, negative. 
And my hope with this conversation is ultimately to kind of reframe our understanding of the use of black in metaphor as um, it's the opposite way of what we're using it right now. To really reclaim black as beautiful and as all inclusive of all colors and as something that's essential, um, that something that it's needed, right? Something that is worthwhile. If we think about um, equating um, blackness with or darkness with um, a more positive reframe of night and nighttime and how night is essential for the restoration and the rejuvenation of our mind, body, and spirit on multiple levels of um, healing that occur during nighttime and that are needed uh, to really live our best lives, right? That can we also reimagine the use of the word shade, right? Um, especially in popular culture, but also in our work. You know, we think of throwing shade as something negative. Whereas, what if we think of shade as a place of respite, as a place where you can um, come out of the light, right? Which can burn. Um, in specifically referencing light to white supremacy here um, and be in a place of protection and cooling down and kind of not getting sunburned, right, or burned by white supremacy. And I think ultimately my hope is to honor a more transnational kind of understanding of how we use metaphor, the words that we use, um, how we talk to each other about the work, um, to our clients, but also how we articulate our ideas in professional contexts. Um, to make sure that we're not replicating the very systems that we're trying to dismantle um, in ways that might be so insidiously entrenched in our psyches, particularly in the United States um, and particularly in Western medical psychological models as we tend to practice them in the United States um, because there's a whole world of different types of models of understanding human existence, not just a suffering and meaning making from suffering, but also joy and enlivening um, and you know, philosophies around how to live um, your life, not necessarily just in a balanced way, the way we think about it in the United States is a little transactional, you know, it's the work-life balance. Um, when actually what we're looking to dig deeper into is like what is or what are the things that give us purpose and meaning? And how do we understand our life's work, not just as mental health clinician, as an expressive arts therapist, as an artist, but also how do I hold that space um, with a client who is ultimately trying to discern um, what purpose or meaning um, their life holds for them. So in many ways, it's kind of also thinking about uh, indigeneity and the approaches of uh, in indigenous thought and philosophy to honor a reciprocal and mutual relationship 
um, where we consider everything um, and reframe everything as um, needed, uh, mutual, reciprocal, rather than more kind of quote unquote Western structures of the binary of either or, black and white, uh, good, bad, right or wrong. Um, and that hopefully that these conversations elevate our understanding of how, number one, how entrenched white supremacist thinking is, um, how we replicate it knowingly and unknowingly, not at, just at structural oppressive levels, but how we've internalized these oppressive systems. Um, within ourselves as individuals and as communities of individuals living, breathing, um, working side by side, other humans who are consistently um, dehumanized um, in, in multiple ways, um, some more explicit, right, as the Black Lives Matter movement has a uh, dramatically burst open in the national psyche our understanding of state-sanctioned murder of black and brown folks in this country um, without due process, without consideration of human um, dignity and life, um, with bias, with assumptions, um, the list goes on and on. Um, but also here, what we'll focus on are the more implicit types, um, which is kind of what we do in our work. Um, that elevating our understanding of blackness, maybe even in a metaphysical quantum physics frame of the, you know, understanding the dark, energy that the universe has, not as a negative Star Wars type of metaphor, but that it's darkness is not a void, but rather an intricate, interconnected um, web of energy that's essential uh, to holding um, multiple time space realities and matter right uh, like planets and keeps them all kind of in orbit together in some sort of synchronous union um, rather than uh, you know kind of thinking about just whiteness um, and how we elevate it as the blank canvas, right? The empty canvas where we can create and put anything onto it that we can imagine and that that's the only type of space, that white space where possibility is truly um, um, and potential is truly um, held, right? You might say, hey, Angelica, AKA Lady Metaphor, um, I'm going too far. That, that a canvas is just a canvas. And the fact that it's white is just a coincidence. And the fact that we talk about um, a blank canvas as a space for potential positivity, creativity um, is, is just um, the way it is. That we can't necessarily paint on black canvases. Well, that, we'll argue, is something we'll talk about in a different episode. But what I'm really kind of digging at here and pondering and really trying to actively work on is thinking about how we talk about whiteness and blackness in um, the arts um, in this case and we as expressive arts therapists use the arts all art forms in integrated and intermodal ways to help facilitate all kinds of human expression 
So when one color on the color spectrum of all possibilities is um, dominant, whether it's in our society or in the language that we use to communicate how we do our work and why we do our work, I, I can't help but feel that there are connections here and I am not interested in replicating um, these systems in the work that I do. Particularly because I think that we're evolving from thinking about the mental health counselor or the expressive arts therapist um, from Healer, um, which is again another episode um, that we'll talk about, um, and to thinking more of the mental health counselor in recent years as an advocate. Um, so currently, um, my thinking about it actually is that we're actually mental health counselors and expressive arts therapists in particular are revolutionaries. And we are in a fight to dismantle internalized oppressive forces um, and this first episode is kind of the start of this fight. How do we dismantle internalized oppressive forces in our constructs or understanding of blackness um, in particular in our work? So arguably, you know, historical context is needed here especially when we consider about how many of us currently in the United States seem to be um, doing this work. Um, even though expressive arts therapists have um, an international accrediting body called IATA, the work itself, the theories within it, um, the theoricians, the applied practitioners, um, all tend to be white and mostly from a Eurocentric perspective. And what we know is, is that mental health in particular has that kind of Eurocentric Western psychiatric medical model. Um, and that they, these ideas, when they were born and when they started to develop, were at the same time historically that colonialism was beginning to take root in the world. Um, you know, we have to kind of make some connections to that, right? If we think about the transatlantic slave trade, one of the most greatest genocide of any peoples on the face of this planet over the course of hundreds of years. Um, and when that began, how it began, from where it began, and the renaissance that was happening, quote unquote, at similar times, and the advent of medical medicine um, at the same time as we understand Western medical medicine because there were many other cultures with many ancient healing practices that um, were much more tested and had much more evidence, right, um, over thousands of years that worked um, and yet Western medical science, arguably, um, fractured from that, wanting to professionalize um, the practice of healing. This happened at the same time in Europe as the specializations of art making were emerging as well, right? The training of artists 
to do art forms, whether it was visual or dance or um, music, in very specific ways with very specific sounds um, for specific audiences. There's got to be something here where it's all connected, and I think it is. I think there's a, the influence of a Judeo-Christian kind of understanding of the world that kind of weaves itself through all these things, connecting the dots for me. Um, there's a Descartesian understanding of the mind-body split um, that also is a layered adds a nuanced layered understanding to which bodies we or whose minds we elevate versus whose bodies we dehumanize. And ultimately it does come down to blackness versus whiteness. Um, so my hope here with this inaugural episode is just to start a conversation hopefully a creative conversation that creates a new culture, uh, a cultural, a creative cultural revolution of sorts where um, my students always ask me, well, what I feel so powerless, what can I begin to do today to dismantle white supremacy? Well, the first thing you can do, stop using blackness as a negative metaphor. Start using blackness as a positive metaphor. Help people begin to cognitively restructure their understanding of blackness, um, even though they might consciously say, well, I'm not a racist. Everyone has bias, though. Everyone has um, implicit bias, at the very least. Um, everyone prejudges, therefore, is prejudice. Um, and everyone, particularly white folk, need to take immense responsibility for the legacy of colonialism. I myself am a white-skinned Latina, uh, mixed race, um, with indigenous ancestry, but clearly white-skinned and therefore privileged um, because of it. And I'm trying to use that power to amplify the need to decolonialize um, our lived experiences um, and our professional practices. I, you know, I'm just hoping that this is a chance for us to increase invisible um, positions, right? To make visible or amplify the visibility of marginalized, disenfranchised, oppressed groups that tend to be uh, black and brown folks throughout the world, um, African American folks, um, Latino folks, indigenous folks, um, the list goes on and on and in this diaspora of black and brown bodies around the world that we kind of have a greater understanding of a, the transnational context in which we now practice in 2018, both mental health counseling and expressive arts therapy. And that all of this is connected. Right. that decolonizing our work is the first step at the very least, if not hopefully a few more steps down, if you're already doing the work actively of not just allyship,
but becoming accomplices in um, anti-racist, anti-oppressive work. Um, therefore, aka accomplices meaning revolutionaries, right? Um, because just keep pondering as to how we think about blackness and whiteness, the use of those colors in our work, but also the use of the metaphors, you know, I'm, I'm coming out of the dark and into the light. Um, we really take these cliches in popular culture for granted. I mean, what are we really saying when we say that, right? That we're, that a dark place is a bad place. And then what does that mean for dark spaces, right? What does that mean then for black spaces? That those are bad spaces, right? What does that then mean not just for black spaces interpersonally or in society, but internally, right? What does it do to the intergen... And th th we know that intergenerational trauma that African-American... Um, peoples on this um, northern continent, but really throughout um, black folks throughout the Pan-African diaspora in, in a global context, the intergenerational trauma that the transatlantic slave trade genocide um, did to change the molecular structure of DNA to um, impact interpersonal, relational, familial connections, um, and the resiliency that shouldn't just be kind of characterized as post-traumatic growth, that black folks in the uh, Pan-African diaspora have kind of demonstrated, um, but that it's actually exactly what I'm talking about here, that black is resilience, right? That black is power, that black is beautiful in spite of, in the face of whiteness, white supremacy, white construction of social order and dominance. So I hope that this has just given you some things to think about, some things that might be, um, hopefully are challenging, provocative, um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, um, all types of creative cultural conversations are welcome whether they be verbal cognitive or somatic kinesthetic you can record yourself and send me a video um, send some artwork along write some poetry any sort of arts-based response is specifically what we're hoping for here to kind of continue to creatively meditate on these ideas and to use creativity as a form of knowledge building um, in our work to create new theories and new practices that are inclusive, not just diverse. Until next time.